This presentation is for the Memorial Symposium of uh, Professor Yasushi Tozawa, the Plasticity Framework for Forming Application. I am Frederic Barla and my co-author is uh, Toshiko Kuwabara. So the outline is basically I will talk about isotropic hardening distortional hardening and the influence of hydrostatic stress on plasticity. And the objective, well, I'm going to talk about numerical simulation. Here, this is an example of a B-pillar um, for a TRIP 1180 steel sheet. So here, for instance, we see the stress contour, and this may be useful for the calculation of spring back. We may also represent the strain contour, which give indication of the location with um, well, potential failure is uh, possible. So we need a constitutive model to do those simulations. And of course, we are going to talk about plasticity. For isotropic hardening, I will go directly to what we see in a pipeline. Uh, we see the, the isotropic yield surfaces of the uh, von Mises, Tresca, and also Urche with different exponents, six and eight. And what we see from this figure is that um, we have area uh, in, in Tresca, except for von Mises, we have area of um, low curvature like here or there and high curvature like in a corner or in a ver the vertex for um, Tresca. And if we have an isotropic material, um, we would get something similar, but the, the only difference is we wouldn't get the six-fold symmetry that we have for isotropic materials. To, to, do, to look at uh, the shape of the yield surface, we can do biaxial experiments, and like in biaxial tension, um, in this work done by Professor Kuwabara, and the alloy is 6016-O, an aluminum alloy. We are the first quadrant, quadrant so the, the stress are positive. And again, well, the material is strongly textured, but uh, anyway, we see those area with low curvature here and high curvature. So this is also apparent experimentally. And so the, the shapes of those yield surfaces actually justify the use of non-quadratic yield function. And uh, if we want to look at the entire, um, um, the four quadrant of the stress, but this time in a pipeline, we can do um, biaxial compression of uh, stack sheet specimen, but this is, was done by Professor Tozawa in the 60s and the 70s. And this is an example for an aluminum alloy. And, and we see the same feature as before means, I mean, the area with low curvature and area with high curvature. If we do crystal plasticity, again, we see the same features, area with low curvature and area with high curvature. And here we use two different uh, crystal plasticity models. So this is really a feature of um, um, metals, uh, cubic metals, and uh, this was already shown by Professor Kuwabara in the 60s and 70s. So now let's talk about distortional hardening. Uh, if we do crystal plasticity, okay, this is a, an isotropic material, and in the pipeline, the deviatoric plane, um, if we do um, tension in this direction, in this direction of H here, and we have only crystal plasticity, then the yield surface is going to expand more or less like this. Okay, 
but if we include a dislocation density model, um, which account for dislocation interaction, actually what we are going to see is uh, something like this, with a flat at the side opposite to loading. And this flat, you can see, is um, orthogonal to or is in a direction, normal is in the direction of loading. If we do, if we look at some experiment of Professor Tozawa, here the material was pre-strained rolling in this direction here, 40%, and then it was rolled in different direction at 0.2% uh, of set strain and up to 0.3%. And what we can see is the yield surface is distorted also. Maybe we have a little bit of translation, but what I see mostly is a distortion. And uh, the distortion is the highest for the lowest um, offset strain. And if we look at uh, this size here of the unloading stress, uh, you know, it's bigger than, it's larger than the uh, reloading, well, the flow stress at, uh, after 3% of, um, of reloading. So the stress hasn't recovered yet. So we see that Tozawa's experiments include strain pass changes and they lead to the same trends as, as the crystal plasticity that we saw here. Now we have a model to, we developed a model to represent this and basically there are two terms here. And the first term really, so here the, the the dark line is isotropic hardening, and if the yield surface is uh, normalized, then this line is, uh, is constant for isotropic hardening. But actually what we observe experimentally is that we have some um, contraction here. We call that cross-loading contraction, because cross-loading is in a direction perpendicular to the loading. Um, and this is one feature of uh, the deformation or the distortion of the yield surface. The other feature is we have a truncation, truncation this way, okay, now in the direction um, with normal aligned to loading. And in this case, the distortion of this result is going to give something like this. So basically, this is the same as here, but there is some truncation here with some uh, rounded uh, corner that occurs due to the formulation. So this is the essence of the model, HH20. If we have a plastic anisotropy in a model, like here a strong 111 fiber in BCC uh, steel, what we see is the distortion is not, you know, um, orthogonal to H here. The flat is not orthogonal to H. But what we notice is that it's, it's parallel to the tangent of the uh, yield surface at the loading point. And when we look at other orientation, we find the same result. So plastic anisotropy modifies distor distortion orientation. And this uh, HH20 model was modified accordingly. So basically, this is uh, the function that represents the, the, the truncation is modified. And this is what we find. Um, the original model is a dashed line here or HH20, that we call 20H. And uh, the, this modification leads to the solid line, which is HAH20 epsilon. And you see the, the flat here is parallel to the uh, tangent of the yield surface at the loading. But in retrospect, we saw that 
Professor Kuwabara, uh, sorry, Professor Tozawa observes the same uh, feature. Um, so this material, it's a steel, it was, uh, Unix, it was pulled in UXL tension. We have some kind of flattening here, but this flattening is not orthogonal to the, um, the loading direction, but again, it's parallel to the tangent of the yield surface. So, um, we already have this in Professor um, Tozawa experiments, but actually we noticed it only after we did the crystal plasticity simulation. Now, in, usually we say that the hydrostatic stress has no effect on plasticity, but actually there's, there's a little bit of effect. So, for instance, if we look at the strength differential effect, it's uh, if we look at uh, the flow curve, true strain, true stress in tension and compression for high strength steel. Um, we see there's a difference. The compressive stress is higher. And the main reason for this is because there's a small influence of pressure on plasticity. And if we look at experiments that were done um, with a pressure confinement, we find that the true stress at a given offset strain, the true stress increases when the hydrostatic pressure increases. Okay, you see, you get a slope here. Uh, for a regular uh, pressure insensitive material, this would be horizontal. So it's not really due to a strain pace pass change, but this is something that that affects um, our calculation later. And we have a model for that, and in this model, of course, we have the trace of uh, the stress tensor, and alpha is the so-called pressure coefficient, and it was me measured for steel by Spitzik and Richmond, it's, and it's for all steel, it's about 20 terapascal minus 1. Um, and if we look at uh, an application on TRIP 1180, when we do a cycle, tension compression, well, tension compression and tension, without, uh, the experiment is a black line, and without um, pressure effect, alpha equals zero, we are not able to capture the, the compression curve. Well, we could adjust the coefficients to put this curve here, but then in that case, we would overshoot the, uh, the experimental intention. And we can get the uh, good uh, approximation, both in tension and compression, only when we use uh, uh, pressure coefficients, and here we use 30 Pascal minus one application. So if we do two-step tension tests, so two-step tension, we do a first tension in a large on a large specimen, and then cut uh, other tensile specimens smaller out of the gauge area, and we can do that in different orientation. And so we do another tensile test. So this is two-step tension specimen. And what we observe, if we have a 45 degree change, we get those uh, experiments, the circle. And we can fit the model HH20 or the previous version of the model, it's called HH14 in blue. Um, and this is a monotonic curve in the same direction as this this curve here, so we recover the stress. Now we can use these coefficients that we identified here uh, to calculate, um, to predict um, the flow curve when we have 90 degree change. And in fact, the prediction with HH20 model is in very good agreement with the experiments. The previous version of the HH model underestimates uh, the flow stress um, 
quite significantly. So we have improved this uh, formulation in the uh, HH20 version. Well, we can do cyclic loading also. I'm not going to explain this, but this model was implemented in finite element code. And we did successful uh, simulation of a B-pillar with this model, with strip 1180 steel sheet. Um, and actually, the results are those that I showed at the beginning of this, of this presentation. So I'm not going to discuss more, but just that even though the model is relatively complex, we are able to do the simulation of, um, of this complex part also. The part is quite complex, B-pillar. Okay, the conclusion is, well, the Professor Tozawa's data is relevant to develop new constitutive models. And uh, we've seen that or we also infer that the strain pass change experiments require careful design and execution. Um, HH20 is more accurate than isotropic hardening when uh, we have loading uh, changes. Um, and uh, we still need to show the superiority for forming um, because we, are, we need to do more examples for that. Now I want to discuss a little bit. We see an emergence of new constitutive description such as the data-driven base model and um, I think it's still important to have a good constitutive model for two reasons. First, when we have function that based on mathematics and that, that include the good physics in it, 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 it allows the, um, the um, um, representation of, uh, of the linkage of the different scars of uh, noisy data. And also, constitutive model is essential for interpolation and extrapolation. Okay, thank you for your attention. I will um, switch slide for my last slide, will be that one. The symposium attended by Professor Tozawa. Thank you very much.